Welcome to Wine Soundtrack Canada. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of the Wine Soundtrack Canada. It is your host, Christine Campbell, and today I am delighted to be sitting in downtown Vancouver with Kat DaCosta from Okanagan Crush Pad. Welcome, Kat. Can you tell us, uh, me and the listeners, a little bit about about the Okanagan Crush Pad, please. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so we're a winery that's sitting about 35,000 cases, and we're really committed to sustainability, organics, uh, trying to be leaders in any kind of new technology or helping people open the door to new things like sustainability, organics, biodynamics, and all that kind of stuff. And where are you located? Winery is located in Summerland, BC. So what types of wines are the Okanagan Crush Pad known for? Varietals or... Any kind of wine. Is it whites, reds? Are they known for organics? Uh, Typically organics. Um, We do focus highly on that. We do a mix of whites and reds. We have a pretty big sparkling program as well. So we do anything from Charmat to traditional method sparkling. Um... A couple of our main grapes are Gamay and Chardonnay. They're both just amazing grapes that we get to work with, and they suit the organic and high altitude we have. And they are delicious. You can take it from me. Um, Where do you find that you are selling the majority of your wines? What are your markets? Is it British Columbia mainly? Is it Canada? Are Are you shipping internationally? A little bit internationally. Um, We we sell a lot through the tasting room, DTC. Uh, That obviously this year is a little bit difficult because we're doing a lot of construction and a lot of new things happening through there. So winery is secondary focus right now. Um, But Vancouver is a huge, huge uh, member of where we sell our, our wines. Kat, what is the first memory you have of wine growing up in the world? And being who you are today? Uh, I would have to say that my interest and love of wine comes from my, my aunties. Um, they were people who, as soon as we got into the house, the first thing was a glass of wine on the table. And if you didn't have a glass of wine in your hand, someone was already ready and willing to pour you something or was already poured. Um, going out camping with my aunts and uncles, and it was just something that we did. We talked about it. We enjoyed it. And Matus was always on the table. And so now I'm happy to say that I did it. I drank it and I've, I've kind of moved on from that a little bit. But uh, it, it was an amazing opportunity to have such amazing family members introduce you to that and just pull you through it. And wine and camping like that. That is a, a pretty cool combo that as a kid, I, I don't really... My goodness, I would put like beer and camping together or, you know, hard bar, but not wine. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was it was cool I, to, to be able to listen to. And I remember this from being really young, uh, not quite drinking yet, of course, but it was always talked about. And our family loves food as much as wine. And beer was always on the table as well. But uh, beer was kind of the, OK, we're done with wine or we've had too much wine. We're going to go to beer <laughs> um, or the boys were drinking beer. But uh, it was just yeah, it was always talked about. It was always around. And so when the intrigue started to happen, I had just so many people that I could go to and say, well, where did you start? What did you drink? And what's good? What's in your cellars? And, yeah. What do you recall is the first memorable wine you drank? And what was the occasion? Hmm. Uh, this one's a bit of a, a heart kind of moment for me. Um, when I first met my now fiancé, uh, we were sitting outside right by the Penticton sign and we were still working together at the time. We were both in the restaurant industry and we weren't even dating yet, but he, we sat down and we opened a bottle of Brad Cooper's Pinot Noir, Black Cloud, and it was the first time that I had ever sat down to drink a bottle of wine to truly enjoy it and I knew the winemaker. And that was just the coolest thing in the world for both of us. And to say, like, oh, yeah, we know Brad Cooper, and we, he made this wine, and we're going to open it up together. And then from there, it just both of us spawned our love for trying to be in the industry. And here you are, winemaker. Brilliant. Brilliant. If you're traveling the world abroad, 
What would you say is your best foreign wine experience you've enjoyed? Is there a foreign region that kind of draws you back over and over again? Uh, well, uh, I think Italy. Um, there's there's uh, there's a region I really want to visit because we haven't done it. But Italy was I was. 19 years old I was with my family there was like 40 of us at all from around the world we all grouped up we met there and it was in northern Italy and I remember being so jet lagged we got to the place and it was this little villa in Tuscany and uh, they just handed us their wine cellar keys and said you know bottles are labeled we know which ones you take and uh I just remember going into that cellar and literally dusting off bottles and just being like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever... And some of them didn't even have labels on them. And we drank them and there was just... It was something that I would love to recreate again. Yeah, that sounds like a movie. (laughs) Maybe there is one out there already. (laughs) And who do you think um, amongst the world's populations... What country drinks the best wine in terms of quality? Not the most, but what what country do you think around the world is a quality wine consumer? Quality wine consumer. I feel like wine is really opening up to a, a lot of people now. Um, there's quality wine coming out of so many different places I don't know if I could nail down one from Italy to we had some Croatian wine here and you know I think it's generally becoming something that everyone can grab a hold of quality wines. Do you think though that say Americans drink better quality wine over Canadians or do French drink better quality wines over Italians or is that just do you just think that That's hard. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. I, I feel like, again, wine is so personal, um, and and quality depends. You know, some people think organic is quality versus you know old world versus new world. So yeah, I feel like that's a uh, time and a place for everyone. And what wine in your cellar is currently giving you the most satisfaction right now? What wine are you going back to over and over again? That's a that's a good question. Uh, we've been drinking a lot of Van Westen because I just love Van Westen wine. Um, Can you tell us about the variety of what it is that you're drinking? Oh, uh, so um, again, going back to my fiance, we're we're both in this together. We drink a lot of wine together. Um, we've got every vintage of the Roman V, which is his blend, um, except for 2009, which. I will throw out there that he did promise to give that to us on our wedding day, as long as he's invited. Is that a white or a red? It's a red. Yeah, it's his big red blend. Um, so that that has been a staple on our, it's just Van Weston on the table. Um, obviously, Crush Bad is always on a table for us as well. But uh, we've been really trying to focus in on not so much going outside of our area, but really trying to focus in on what's around us, because there's so much around us. And I feel like we get cellar palate quite easily. We're both winemakers, so we drink our own wine a lot. Uh, so yeah, we've been trying to pop around to all the new places and just that's what's on our table recently. BC wine, I like it. Kat, do you believe in a perfect grape variety? Mm. I mean, Gamay is pretty pretty close for me. Um, but again, I think I my, my love of wine comes from just how diverse it is and whether it's whites reds turned into whites because you don't leave it on skins or I think there's so much out there that I don't know that I could pick a perfect one but Gamay's up there it's definitely up there I agree I call Gamay my boyfriend wine and I don't really know why maybe it's just because it's light and fruity and it doesn't demand too much of me yeah I like that that's amazing (laughs) I won't tell you what I call Syrah or (laughs) Cabernet Sauvignon. Just kidding. Um, In your opinion, what... I'm going to say this differently. What is your opinion of wine critics and wine scores? Hmm. Um, That's interesting. So that's something that we've actually talked about a little bit more working with uh, Crushpad, or since I've been working with Crushpad, because I've been introduced to a lot more wine critics, and our wines were, were big enough to be able to push our wines out there and I think it's an amazing thing uh, to, to 
be lucky enough like I was to have people that already know wines, aren't scared of wines, can, you know, throw something on the table and just, you know, I like to say for science, you know, you open a bottle and you never know what you're going to get um, and not be scared of that. But if you go into a liquor store and you don't really feel comfortable with wine, you don't have a lot of people around you, to be able to go to that one person or a couple wine critics and be like, you know, I've tried something of them, I like their style. I'm going to keep going. And then you start to get comfortable. I think that's amazing. And then it also opens up our industry to so many more people. As a consumer cat, do you consider yourself more of a white, red, or rosé drinker? I love red wine. Red wine in its entirety. I don't think there's a single red wine out there I don't like. So I'm going to say reds, and then rosé is close to red, so that is also it. (laughs) And do you tend to reach for still wines or sparkling wines? Until recently, I've mainly kind of, because of the red styles, I've focused on still wines, but um, I've done a lot of kind of digging deep for uh, sparkling because we make a lot of sparkling at Crush Pads. So I wanted to kind of expand my palate and understand what consumers like. And so because of that, I found some amazing wines out there that... I never would have picked up on my own. Um, So starting to get into the sparklings. And sparkling wines, are you going to reach for a champagne or is there a non-vintage brut or are you into Prosecco or Cava or Lambrusco? Where where do you go with sparkling? I, at the moment, I'm I'm fascinated with champagne. Um, Again, it's a good starting point, I think, because it's something that's very known. I love that yeasty, bready, when you pop it open, it just smells like brioche, and it, that just hits all the nerd buttons for me. Um, so that's where I kind of aim for, and then, but I'm always happy to open something that I have you know, no previous knowledge of. Kat, I've been here before, and I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and think that you might have as well. We've had one extra, maybe two, extra glasses of wine we might not shouldn't have I don't know should shouldn't have do you have a cure for a hangover that uh, seems to work for you or that you would like to share with the listeners we're always looking for a good (laughs) a good way around a hangover I that that's awesome I love that um I think the the first thing that I usually do is as soon as you have that wine that that at the end of the night you're like "Uh uh-oh that's uh that might hurt me tomorrow um I usually go in and I will drink the biggest glass of water I can, maybe eat a little bit of bread and uh, orange juice. And first thing in the morning, I just down some orange juice. And usually I'll force myself to just go out for a probably very slow walk. It's not a run, (laughs) but some to just kind of get the body moving and going. Orange juice? Yeah, I I don't know. It just gives me a little bit of, I feel like I'm doing something healthy for myself, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Guess who's buying orange juice today? Woohoo! Okay, here's an interesting one. Um, what does a non-drinker lose out on by not tasting your wine? Non-drinker not tasting our wine. Uh, I feel like that's... You're missing a point where, you know, I guess you're interested in organics or something like that. And you're, the, the flavor profiles for me are a little bit different because when you when you don't have those chemicals in the vineyard and you just fully allow the grapes to be exactly what they are you get another expression of them and I know that organics are starting to become more adapted uh, throughout wineries around this area for sure um, but I think for ours you know Matt Dumain which is another reason I love working with him he he wants the, you know, Gamay to be exactly what Gamay is. And I think if you're not drinking that, then yeah, you miss a little bit of that. It's a beautiful answer. Thank you. So from a beautiful question to a, <laughs> an out there question, <laughs> space aliens, you look out from the crush pad and you see space aliens landing in the vineyards of Okanagan crush pad. What are you going to serve them from the Okanagan crush pads labels to say this is a good taste of who we are that's awesome I love that question um well I mean I I would hope that my first run out there is with a flight maybe like an armful of a couple bottles and saying like I got sparkling I got rosé I got whites whatever you want (laughs) but uh because I love the gamay so much I think you know maybe 
maybe if they like the gamay, then we can get along and it's on the right foot. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, gamay. I like it. So vintages often tell a different story. Do you find that there are more things that repeat themselves or is it becoming more the opposite? I, I think it's becoming more the opposite. I think people are starting to really uh, steer away from wines that are always, you know, consistent and, and not to say, you know, balance or anything like that, but just consistent flavor profiles because that means that, you know, you are you are intervening in the wine. And so because we've had such unbelievable weather and over the, especially over the last five years, um, people are really truly getting interested in you know vintage and you know year in the bottle kind of style and it's interesting in our area because people are coming back to you know we have so many wineries so to have everything the same would probably cause people to start you know maybe come to the Okanagan once in four years Um, but with that intrigue of every year is different I think that encourages people to just keep trying different wines that are the same. So Okanagan Crush has Gamay is going to be Gamay, but you're going to see little differences each year, and I think people are getting more and more intrigued about that. I couldn't agree with more with you, actually, and nothing says this is a wine than this is a vintage. This is the wine of the vintage, and I think more and more, specifically in British Columbia, the winemakers are choosing to embrace that. And they're not scared of it. They don't want to have the same wine taste the same all the time. They want it, the vintage to show. Absolutely. And I think that in itself is what's allowing, uh, you know, people like uh, Okanagan Crush Pad and all these people that are pushing organics and sustainability uh, to open that door because, you know, people aren't expecting every single year to be the same. So when you farm and, uh, you know, I'll give credit to Duncan Billing, our, our viticulturalist, he, he's an amazing farmer. So we know the grapes are going to be good, even if there's small differences. And it, uh, yeah, it, it allows people to be intrigued and hear a story about the rest of it and not, the, not necessarily the struggles behind it all the time. But uh, yeah, it just opens the door for it, I think. So harvest is just about to begin, let's say. Do you have any good luck rituals that you kind of do or you're even conscious of? Do you play an album? Do you do something unique every single harvest to kind of get in the mood? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I'm i just coming out of vintage. So usually it's like, okay, I've got a couple months to get my tan on before I get pulled back in the cellar full time. Um, so usually that's part of it. But... I, I love music. Music is what keeps me going. I know a lot of winemakers are the same way. Um, so both Matt and I will, you know, you can tell our kind of levels of getting closer and closer to harvest because our music gets a little faster, a little harder, <laughs> a little bit more, a little louder. And yeah, so I think uh, usually my, my fiance and I as well, like we love Coheed and Cambria. It's our high school, like love of bands and music so that's usually pretty much consistently on in the cellar when we're like kind of pumping ourselves up to get ready for the you know the craziness of long hours and all that kind of stuff so the good luck ritual is uh good loud music i like that a lot so i've heard that certain producers walk in their cellars and speak to wine in the barrel do you do that cat and or do you speak to the vines in the vineyard if you do either of those things, what do you say? I, I, so I've worked alone quite often and I come from service industry and I feel like every person in a service industry gains this, like, we just talk to ourselves or, you know, to whatever you're doing, even if it's, you know, polishing glassware. Um, so I absolutely talk to the barrels, the tanks, the, you know, the vineyard for sure when I'm out there. Uh, I'm not in the vineyard as much anymore, which is too bad, but I'm pushing hard in the cellar, so that's okay. But yeah, I, I definitely talk to the wines and the, and the wine and you got this and like, you know, you some smell funky and you're like, okay, you can do this. Like, you're all right. And what do you need? And <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could hear the answers, right? That'd be lovely. When you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, I wanted to be a teacher and I, I never knew like a teacher of what um, I just I loved teaching and ever since I was little that was the one thing that if you know if I was 
good in a class or something like that and someone needed help, I loved being able to help people. Um, so that kind of continued on through restaurant industry, training, hiring, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I, I still kind of get to do that a little bit, but I, I also think that, you know, somewhere down the road I can still maybe accomplish a little bit of that. When you are not working, what do you do in your sp- your free time, spare time? Uh, I love gardening. Um, I, I'm pretty much, like, if I can work with my hands, that's, that's what I'm doing. So creation, um, I love writing, I love reading. Um, that takes up most of my time. Yeah, so. Do you play a specific sport at all? No, I don't really play sports. Uh, I, I, like I said, I, I like my calm, you know, grab a glass of wine, sit out in the garden, pull some weeds, and that kind of style. So that's a different kind of, It's maybe some people consider gardening a sport. I don't know if I ever have considered it a sport, but I'm sure some... If it is, then I'm completely down for that sport. <laughs> You're the gardening sport. We'll put it into the Olympics. Do you have a favorite singer or a group? Uh, yeah, so that's... that's um, Kogi and Camarilla, but Tool. Uh, Maynard James Keenan is what has, again, been on every playlist I've ever created since I listened to music. Um, but he's also transitioned into winemaking. And right as I moved to the Okanagan, he put out his Blood into Wine uh, um, media show, and I just absolutely fell in love and I just I wanted to do everything I could to get into wine industry and that's kind of what pushed me to truly do it yeah so well that's a cool connection there do you have a favorite film dedicated to wine yeah it'd be blood into wine (laughs) (laughs) let me just let me just lead that right into the answer okay you and your fiance are about to have a romantic evening out in a restaurant, what wine do you order to kick the evening off? I think that depends on uh, what we're doing or where we are. We, Our favorite cuisine is Japanese cuisine. Um, so that's something that uh, we both love Rieslings. They're fresh. They're citrusy. Uh, they go really well with sushi. So that's kind of our, our main go. Yeah. Do you have a piece of advice that you received over your lifetime that has done you well? Yeah, uh, it uh, it sticks with me every day, and especially during harvest and the times that I just you know, need a little bit of a push. But my my father had always said, "Be anything but average and ordinary," and that that rings through my head consistently. And when I struggle with something and I look around and say it's easier to not. If that's what every, you know, like the average or the ordinary would do, that pushes me to just keep going. Okay, well, I think that that is amazing advice that you received and you're now passing on to us. So I'm going to put that one in my back pocket for sure. What is your proudest achievement in your work thus far? Oh, um, I honestly, I think being being recognized and being able to be pulled into to crash pad because it's something that I've I've worked hard for a long time to get to a position I I didn't really know what the position was uh, I just knew I loved food I loved wine I was in the service industry I cooked for 10 years and was ready to get my red seal and it, something just never felt right and the second I walked into Crush Pad, I was like, yeah, this is this is amazing. I'm surrounded by intelligent, passionate people that push others to do as much as they can. And so being recognized to uh, fit into that group was like, yeah, okay, I've, I've done something right here. <laughs> Big smile on your face. Can you complete this sentence for me? A table without wine is like? It's not a very good table at all. <laughs> It's not a very good table at all. We all need wine on the table, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think the wine makes uh, makes everything just go a little bit better and more interesting. Kat, do you think we're still going to be enjoying wines in 2300? And what type of wines do you think we'll be enjoying then? That's awesome. I love that question. Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, we, from the second that we, I'm sure we accidentally fermented grapes and someone drank it and was like, well, it's not terrible. Um, we've refined and we've created and crafted and continued to craft for, for hundreds of years. And it's only spread to more countries and to more diverse populations and, and age groups and stuff like that. So I feel like it's going to continue on and we're probably going to see some crazy hybrids of aromatics and all that kind of stuff so Mm -hmm. how about in 2000 years time do you think we're going to still be drinking wine yeah i i feel like wine is one of those things that we we will always struggle to be as new as we can while still holding on to that you know original old feeling like you know with with crush pad we still ferment in clay amphora even though we have all the technology to not do that uh so that leads me to believe that i think we're as humans we're always going to have a connection with wine can you give me three wines that you would take with you to either a deserted island if that's your fancy or to outer space what wherever you wherever your heart Where desires <laughs> uh i have a love of plum wine it's it's not, uh, I don't drink a lot of sweet wine, but that is something that it will always be in my bag, um, for sure. Um, any kind of Riesling, um, yeah, and then Gamay's. Yeah, give me some Gamay. We keep coming back to Gamay, I like it. <laughs> so you kind of referenced this earlier, but you didn't say, so here's the question. Where is the winemaking area in the world that you would really like to explore? Uh, so Yamanashi Prefecture is in Japan, and it's something that uh, we spent a month there a couple of years ago, and it was it was amazing. But we missed the wine region, and so that's that's our main goal is to go there. They have these beautiful pergola setups for their for their vineyards, and um, they they grow a grape called uh, Koshu, I believe, and. It's absolutely stunning. It looks like muscat almost. It's got that pink kind of tinge to it, and it makes these really citrusy and super, super diverse. You can make orange wines, white wines, sparklings, and so we want to go and take a look at that, and I'm super fascinated by it. Please report back to me. I am totally intrigued. Okay, Kat, we're not quite finished yet. It is the wine soundtrack, so we have to have some music in here. It's time to play a little game. I'm going to pick out three different grape varieties, and I'd love for you to pair the grape variety with either a song, a band, and if neither of those come to your head, then a genre. Okay? We're going to start with (gasps) Gamay. Hmm. I would say Gamay. Yeah, You're right. It is diverse. It's fruity, but it's got deep notes to it as well. So I think it's kind of, it's like the prog rock. Like it can kind of go all over the place. And as you're drinking it, you're smelling something light and fruity, but you're tasting something else. You've got tannins, you got, yeah. So I, I would say, I would kind of push that into prog rock. So that's the Coheed and Cambria. <laughs> Super. Riesling. Hmm, that's a good one. Hmm. Riesling, I think, would have to be, it's a little bit more crisp. You've got bright acidity to it. It's very kind of, yeah, citrusy. Hmm. Let's go with uh, something like first thing that pops into my head is freddie mercury yeah (laughs) i've never thought about that but that's what came to mind (laughs) freddie mercury's always the answer just like champagne is always the answer (laughs) okay last one i think i'm gonna hit you with i'm gonna hit you with syrah Mm. i think syrah first for me syrah kind of kicks in as something uh, like the Rhone style, so uh, north, like Northern Rhone, um, so delicate, elegant. Um, I listen. I love orchestral music, uh, so I would say something like maybe Ludovico and Audi. Hmm. Very specific. <laughs> I love it. Kat, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you please remind the listeners of Wine Soundtrack Canada where we can find the Okanagan Crush Pad wines? Is your tasting room? open currently or what is coming up for you guys 
Yeah, so uh, our tasting room will be open next year, so we're closed down, uh, but online for sure. Uh, that's one of the best places you can get all of our wines shipped to you, and depending on where you are, of course. Um, yeah, so our tasting room is fully being rebuilt, uh, so that will be next year that you'll be able to come visit, and hopefully by that point we'll have a new lookout point up at Garnet Valley Ranch, uh, so there'll be kind of two areas that you can come and, and take a look at our stuff. So back to recording. So can you just tell the listeners what your website address is and the social media handles that uh, people can follow you on Instagram or the the socials? So our main one is uh, for the website, which is okanagancrushpad.com. Our Instagram is okcrushpad. Kat, you've been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me on the Wine Soundtrack Canada. I hope you have a wonderful day. Any last words for the listeners? Uh, well, this was always a pleasure with talking with you, so I'm stoked to be able to do this. Um, yeah, take a look at what we're doing. We've got a lot going on, and if you're up on Instagram with us, you'll see kind of the building developments, what we're doing, the new wines that we're putting out, and yeah, just keep, keep trying new wines and don't be scared of wine. It's amazing. Fabulous. Thank you all. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack Canada. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.